John Whiteside Parsons, better known as Jack Parsons, a founding member of Jet Propulsion Laboratories during the late 1930s, was not only a pivotal American rocket propulsion researcher, but he was also an occultist, magician, thelemite, and member of Aleister Crowley's Ordo Templi Orientis. Born on October 2nd of 1914, Parsons grew up in a wealthy family living in Los Angeles, California. His stated isolation as a child and unfortunate experiences with other children caused him to focus more on his education. He went to a private high school and when Jack was a teenager, his father walked out on him and his mother. His father was said to have been involved in an affair with another woman and to help Jack, his grandfather filled in as some semblance of a father figure for him as he finished his adolescent years. It was during this time that he developed an interest in chemistry and science, which would lead him to experimenting with black powder rockets with friend and mechanic Edward Foreman. In his senior year of high school, he got a job at Hercules Powder Company and would marry his first wife, Helen Northrup, in 1935. His life would take an interesting turn in 1937, when, though not formally graduate students themselves, Parsons and Foreman, due to their experience and knowledge, would later become involved with the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory of the California Institute of Technology. At Caltech, they assisted grad students Frank Molina, Weld Arnold, Apollo M.O. Smith, and Cyan Hushen with testing a small alcohol-fueled motor to gather data for Molina's graduate thesis. Molina's thesis advisor, aerodynamicist Theodore von Karman, managed to acquire funding from the U.S. Army to help with their research. This venture resulted in the development of solid rocket fuels and the invention of the JATO units for aircrafts, which were presented to the Army in 1941. JATO, standing for Jet Fuel Assisted Takeoff, was a groundbreaking technology which would help to usher in the space age. In 1943, Theodore von Karman, Frank Molina, Jack Parsons, and Edward Foreman established the Aerojet Corporation to manufacture the JATO motors. The corporation would then later become known of as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in November of 1943. Now, not only was Parsons involved with science, but he was also heavily involved in the occult and the teachings of Aleister Crowley. In a real-time films documentary on Jack Parsons titled Jack Parsons' Jet-Propelled Antichrist, author Line Milo Duquette says that not only was Jack Parsons a maverick rocket scientist, but that he was also a maverick rocket scientist spiritually as well. And indeed he was. It was back in 1939, at the ripe age of 25, when Parsons first came across the works of Aleister Crowley, which led him to join Agape Lodge of Aleister Crowley's Ordo Templi Orientis in 1941. Parsons took Freighter 210 as his magical motto and was allegedly initiated by Crowley himself. In 1942, Parsons' father passed away, which resulted in him inheriting a mansion that would become a bohemian haven for Parsons and those of Agape Lodge because in 1943, he would be appointed as Master of the Lodge by Crowley, replacing Wilford Talbot Smith, whom Crowley was receiving complaints over. Apparently, as a result of his conduct, Smith was not only felt to have tainted the reputation of the OTO, but his actions also prompted an FBI investigation of communist activity in conjunction with Agape Lodge, of which no charges were made. This incident, of course, shook up Crowley, and so he removed Smith as Master and replaced him with Parsons. It was felt that Parsons could renew the Lodge with his youthful enthusiasm and eventually utilized his mansion in conjunction with Lodge activities. Stories about the goings-on in the mansion often involve ceremonies and orgiastic rituals. The local police were often found knocking on his door in response to complaints by neighbors. One such complaint uh, pertained to a pregnant woman leaping over a bonfire in the backyard, <laughs> to which Parsons calmly dismissed by implying that his neighbors were nosy and crazy. <laughs> Along with being a scientist and occultist, like Crowley, Parsons was also a poet. An excerpt from his poem, Or a Flame, which appeared in the Journal of the OTO on February 21st in 1943, seems to echo his exotic bohemian lifestyle at the time. He writes, I hate Don Quixote. I live on peyote, marijuana, morphine, and cocaine. I never know sadness, but only madness that burns at the heart and the brain. 
I see each charwoman ecstatic inhuman, angelic, demonic, divine. Each wagon a dragon, each beer mug a flagon that brims with ambrosial wine. During that same year, he divorced his first wife Helen and began seeing her sister Betty, <laughs> who joined him in his magical pursuits. That is until 1945 when Betty began taking an interest in science fiction author and Church of Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard, who moved into Parsons Mansion in August of 1945, eight years prior to founding the Church of Scientology in December of 1953 in Camden, New Jersey, which is only minutes from where this episode is being recorded. Parsons liked and respected Hubbard, and didn't seem too bothered by Betty's change in affection for him, though some accounts say Parsons was actually very jealous. Parsons wrote to Crowley that Hubbard was probably the most thalamic person he had ever met, and felt that he was in direct touch with some higher intelligence, which he thought may have been Hubbard's holy guardian angel. Parsons, in an appreciation for Hubbard, allegedly revealed the knowledge of certain oath-bound OTO rituals to Hubbard, who would then even go on to becoming one of Parsons' magical partners, and would act as a seer during Parsons' well-known 1946 Babylon Working, an 11-day sex magic rite that was meant to summon an elemental being, or incarnation of a goddess or force called Babylon, as so mentioned in the Book of the Law. Shortly, if not almost immediately after the rite, Parsons met the red-haired and green-eyed artist, occultist, and actress Marjorie Cameron in his own home, and as a result of their meeting, Parsons concluded that the Babylon working was a success. This permitted them to continue with the next phase of the ritual, which was the creation of a moon child, which would be, for lack of a better term, a messiah figure for the religion of Thelema. Though no physical child came into being from the working, it was believed by Parsons and Marjorie that an astral or spiritual child was created, and that the final phase of the Babylon working was a success. Around the start of the Babylon working, Parsons and Hubbard started a business venture, where Parsons contributed 95% of the initial startup costs, which was most of his savings. When the working had reached its conclusion, Hubbard and Betty left California for Florida after the business fell apart, which nearly left Parsons destitute, but he managed through legal channels to dissolve the business and recover most of his investment. As some reports tell, Crowley predicted this outcome, as he was said to have no love for Hubbard and felt that he was a con artist from the start. In reference to the final phases of the Babylon working, Crowley, who had been keeping a proverbial eye on the goings-on at Agape Lodge, stated in a letter to Carl Germer, the head of the OTO in the US at the time, that apparently Parsons or somebody is producing a moonchild. I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the idiocy of these louts. Crowley's frustration for Parsons' magical endeavors eventually caused him to remove Parsons from his position of power within the OTO, though some sources state that it was Parsons who resigned. This removal by Crowley was probably due to Parsons' receiving of Liber 49 on February 28th during the Babylon working. Parsons proclaimed that Liber 49 was the fourth chapter to the Book of the Law, which was received by Crowley in 1904, which began to weave Parsons himself into the Thelemic Crowleyan mythology. Apparently, the prophecies from the workings and the gall of Parsons did not sit well with Crowley, who may have viewed him as a threat to his own role as prophet of the New Eon and head of the OTO. Eventually, after leaving the OTO, Parsons and Marjorie became married. Parsons sold the home, and he and Marjorie moved to live in the carriage house on the same property, and he found employment with North American Aviation Company and then with Hughes Aircraft. It was during this period of his life when some say he was teetering on madness with his taking of the name and title of Antichrist in 1949, though the lucidity found in his writings from this time argues against this theory. For example, in his essay, Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword, originally written in 1946 but revisited in 1950, is just as insightful now in today's world as it was then. In it, he redefines freedom in the terms understood by Voltaire, Paine, Washington, Jefferson, and Emerson by explaining that freedom is a two-edged sword, of which one edge is liberty and the other responsibility. 
Both edges are exceedingly sharp, and the weapon is not suited to casual, cowardly, or treacherous hands. In the same essay, he discusses science, and in a very interesting, direct, and clear way, explaining its processes and fallacies and how today's science must forever be free to overthrow its yesterdays, otherwise it will degenerate into ancestor worship. Yet, despite his heavy involvement in both science and the occult, Parsons never felt that there was a conflict between the two. In 1951, while allegedly working with Israel to build a plant to develop explosives and armaments, he was brought under investigation by the FBI for possible espionage allegations. Parsons had used his secret clearance at Hughes Aircraft to obtain confidential documents, which resulted in him being fired from Hughes Aircrafts. For the next year, Parsons found work as an explosives consultant for the film industry, and even worked at a local gas station to help make ends meet. However, on June 17th of 1952, while working with chemicals and substances not unfamiliar to him in his garage, Jack Parsons died in an explosion at the age of 38. His wife Marjorie, unscathed by the blast, lived until 1995. However, his mother was so distraught over the death of her son that shortly after his death, she committed suicide as a result of her grief through the overuse of sleeping pills. Though some may choose to forget him, with his genius and ingenuity, Jack Parsons made a landmark contribution to the world with his scientific research in jet propulsion, which as a result initiated the space age and provided the opportunity for the Apollo 11 moon landing to take place. As an acknowledgement of his contribution to science 20 years after his death, the International Astronomical Union named a crater on the dark side of the moon after him. And in February of 2010, a play by the name of Pasadena Babylon, The World of Jack Parsons by George Morgan, directed by Brian Brophy, ran for one week at the California Institute of Technology, memorializing his scientific and occult endeavors. The whole thing is so incredible. The whole story is so amazing, so remarkable. Uh, this is Los Angeles. This is black magic. This is the founding of NASA, of Jet, jet Propulsion Laboratories. What isn't in this story? The craters and mountains of our moon bear the names of giants of science, figures like Archimedes, Kepler, and Copernicus. There is also a crater honoring someone called Jack Parsons. There are some who would rather he had been forgotten. Perhaps that's why his crater is on the dark side of the moon. He was a maverick rocket scientist, okay? He was also a maverick rocket scientist spiritually. This father of American rocketry was also an occultist, devoted to a path still widely misunderstood and feared. So the founding of modern rocket science is absolutely allied and connected with black magic. Only its detractors would call it black magic. For Parsons, this was his spiritual path, as it is for its initiates today. Parsons was a genius. Parsons was a mystic. Parsons was a crazy man. Well, let me tell you about Jack Parsons. Uh, there's a great number of stories about him. There's a great aura uh, of events and people and places and things that he did. And one of the things that uh, I'm fascinated with is the, the man comes on the scene uh, late 1930s, early 1940s in Southern California at a place uh, that was going to be renowned for its development of rockets that would lead on into the later 20th century. And it's at this point in life, too, of uh, my understanding of Parsons, that his life kind of takes a, a turn. And one of the things that apparently is going on here is his involvement with the OTO. I, I don't know how else to explain it, uh, except that there are other influences that are coming into play that are changing others' perception of him 
because they know about the other things he's involved with. During this time, he did uh, looking for something to help pay the rent, <laughs> or well, I guess he owned the place. But he put an ad in the paper, uh, only those who are atheists and I forgot, and oddballs need apply. And we did get, as you say, a diversity of people who were attracted to this kind of an ad. He gave me the Eliphas Levy history of magic, and we talked that over. And Jack told me about some of his careers and some of his aspirations. His, he talked briefly about the rocket that he wanted to go to the moon. One of the other things that was going on in Southern California at this time in the 1930s was the uh, rise of the genre of uh, writing in the United States of science fiction. At an early age, I became interested in science fiction, and uh, many of the science fiction stories were just sort of uh, imagination junk, but others were almost like a prediction of things that are going to happen, actually happen. And uh, when I was at Wright Field and other places, well, a lot of what I would talk about trying to get the powers that were interested in rockets came from what I read in science fiction, the things that were really going to be practical. When Jack and I and all these science fiction writers were co-mingling, we visited back and forth uh, for Heinlein and we'd drive over there and I think Heinlein may have come to South Orange Grove, and uh, stimulated by this um, creative environment, um, Jack wrote a story. A lot of people came around that were, they would come to the house and take him out in the middle of the night. He would come back two hours later, all, all very much disturbed. Then he started talking about the Black Brotherhood. I imagined because the er, the group of the whole sort of magical surroundings that these were guy black head, hooded monks. Well, what he meant, men who wore black suits. Uh, exactly what they did, I don't know. But I do know from listening to oral history interviews that were done with others who observed them that Jack was a disruptive force in the activities at. Aerojet. A mutual friend of ours said to me, did you know Jack was killed in an explosion? I thought, explosion maybe, but Jack was not killed. I don't believe it. Jack was half lying under a heavy cast iron wash tub. The side of his face was blown off. I remember his arm either dangling or that was blown off and there was a lot of blood and Jack was dead. On June 17th, 1952, at 5.08 in the evening, a powerful explosion shook tranquil Pasadena, California. And so ended the life of 38-year-old Jack Parsons. In life, Parsons was an enigma. His death reads like a pulp fiction mystery. Was it an accident? Uh, was it suicide? Uh, was it murder? Was it a strange occult ritual gone wrong? In each world of Parsons, the Parsons inhabited, has its own ending. The occult uh, world has him summoning up a demon. Uh, perhaps you know, his, his rocketry world has him uh, perhaps making an accident from playing so fast and loose with his chemicals. Uh, his Los Angeles world has him being murdered in a kind of uh, uh, a film noir manner. The only way to unravel the mystery of his death is by finding a path through the labyrinth of his life. The last person to see Parsons alive was his uh, lodger who lived uh, in the same building as Parsons' laboratory. His name was Greg Gancy. Now, Gancy recalls going down into the garage where Parsons did his uh, uh, chemical work and seeing Parsons stirring various pots and you know, clicking various funnels and he said to, to Parsons in a jocular tone, whatever you do, Jack, don't blow us up. And the last words he remembers Parsons saying as you know, Greg walked up the stairs back to his apartment was, don't worry, you know, everything's okay. Then, Greg Gancy, the next thing Greg Gancy remembers is a giant explosion taking place. He's in his apartment upstairs. The grand piano he has in his apartment is lifted off the ground and shatters to the ground. He rushes downstairs, and with his uh, colleague, they find Parsons on the floor, 
but somehow Parsons was still alive. They called for the ambulance, the police came, uh, Parsons was taken to our hospital, but his injuries were too severe, and he died within an hour. One thing is certain. Some years earlier, Parsons had, with uncanny foresight, written to Crowley, Babylon is incarnate on the earth today, awaiting the proper hour of her manifestation. And in that day, my work will be accomplished, and I will be blown away upon the breath of the fire. Parsons was a member of the Ordo Templi Orientis, a secret society still in existence today, and worked closely with L. Ron Hubbard on a magical ritual he called Babylon Working, with the ultimate goal of creating a being called a Moonchild that was inspired by the writings of Aleister Crowley. Well, Parsons got involved in this idea of the Moonchild from one of Crowley's novels, and the idea is to... Uh create a, uh, an infant who will be born all through the nine months of pregnancy. There will be all these magical and uh, magical in quotes and uh, other uh, influences to separate the child from normal earthly influences and make them more compatible with life in outer space because uh, Parsons saw the future of humanity as being in outer space. Okay, so a serious question right now. Uh, was Jack Parsons really the Antichrist? The Antichrist? No. An Antichrist? Yes. Um, he set himself up in opposition to all of Western society, basically. Um, he saw himself as an Antichrist, and for him, he was, you know? He wrote a little later in his life, um, not that he had, like, a long life, but chemistry, that sort of thing, um, rocket science, was his earthly work and that his magic and his will, you know, was like the great work, as they say. His, you know, his famous creed was, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And, you know, it, it wasn't, this wasn't really kind of like a, a kind of a phrase which meant you can do whatever you want, but it meant whatever you will, whatever you decide, whatever you put your mind to, you can do it to the fullest extent of your ability. The OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, you know, the members of that at the time, uh, they all live, you know, in a giant pa Pasadena mansion, which Parsons himself owned. I mean, there was a lot of kind of girlfriend swapping, wife swapping. I mean, it was just a kind of, uh, you know, not so much free love, but it was very much what was going on in the 60s, but happening in the, th in the 30s. And so his relationship with his wife uh, early on kind of sets the tone for some of the relationships he has later in his life, too. You know, he ended up hooking up with her little sister, and she left him for the guy who was running the OTO at the time. You know, and also the, order, the higher up you go in the in the OTO in the occult group, the more that sex could actually become a part of a magical working. So, uh, so you would actually, you know, either masturbate or uh, have sex with somebody as part of this magical performance to kind of you know contact people on a on a higher kind of metaphysical plane. Because, uh, we have I mean, the, if, if I saw scientists saying, I'm masturbating on a tablet to, to try to create a moon child, to try to impregnate an inorganic thing, I would, for at least a moment, think, you know, uh, bipolar or uh, something, right? Yeah. Um, so my a guess savant. is that Par Parsons was, was probably a mental case. And then, I mean, there's other stuff that, like, you know, make him a really relatable character. You know, he was really interested in science fiction. Uh, Jack Williamson was his favorite writer, and he got a chance to meet him, which didn't go exactly how Jack Parsons had planned. I guess he was expecting Jack Williamson to be like, oh, yeah, you know, what you're doing is exactly what I'm writing about. And actually, you know, he brought him to a Gnostic mass, and he was, like, totally underwhelmed. Parsons at the time, uh, in the late 40s, and the mid-late 40s, was part of a big science fiction scene. And so he had become friendly with a lot of the, the authors. Uh, he was friendly with uh, Robert Heinlein, with Ray Bradbury, with the kind of greats of the golden age of, of, of science fiction writing. And, uh, you know, one of the great science fiction writers at the time was L. Ron Hubbard. Um, this was before he founded Scientology or, or, or had written Dianetics. And they became actually very close friends. Uh, Hubbard came and moved into Parsons' house in Pasadena with him. Um, in fact, uh, Hubbard came in and, and took Parsons' girlfriend away from him. Um, but that was all part of the house. That's, you weren't meant to feel guilty about that, or you weren't meant to feel envious. You know, people just 
swapped girlfriends as they did, and, and so Parsons let that go. But then uh, Hubbard started to help Parsons with his magical workings, and that's when everything gets a little uh, kind of confused. You could say that, you know, Hubbard uh, was, was Parsons' kind of assistant in these rituals. And, you know, there are plenty of writings from the OTO and from Parsons himself in which he describes performing these rituals with L. Ron Hubbard, kind of waving swords around in the air, you know, burning incense, chanting for days on end. In making the graphic novel, did you ever try any of the ceremonies that Jack Parsons performed? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, no, I didn't. I read over them, you know, quite a few times. Um, and I was familiar with some of the basic sort of Aleister Crowley stuff, you know, banishing rituals and those kinds of things. And, you know, when I was a kid, I dabbled around with that kind of stuff. But then things went south. Uh, you know, Hubbard inveigled himself into into Parsons' life. And then, uh, from what I can gather, uh, he took $20,000 worth of Parsons' money, ran off with his girlfriend, and bought a boat in Florida with it. If you were thinking about UFOs and so on, you have to remember the kind of Parsons died 1952, just as the whole kind of UFO craze was really taking off. Um, so he was really just before the UFO kind of craze really was interested in. I mean, he read a lot of sci-fi and he was interested in <clears throat> stories of other worlds. But I think he was less interested in, in whether there's life out there. He wanted to be the life out in outer space. Well, since then, we found out that going into outer space creates a mutation in consciousness anyway. 85% of the American astronauts and the Soviet cosmonauts have all had, mystic, quote, mystical experiences. And Parsons was trying to create a child who would be born with that kind of consciousness and would never be dragged down by the... Uh, I can't help quoting Timothy Leary again. Gravity is the enemy. Levity is the salvation. Levitate. Go, go higher. Don't, don't get pulled down. Don't get dragged down. Don't be too grave, don't be too serious. And uh, Parsons understood that. We're, it's time for us to get used to outer space. And it's happening, whether Parsons was responsible or not. I, uh, some people think uh, his Mojave Venus working uh, was not completed properly, and that's why we're having all these weird UFO uh, phenomena. Whether that's true or not, we are getting ready for outer space by the, just by the simple fact that so many millions of people believe they've had outer space contacts already. They're turning into moon children in the Parsons sense. 